on today's Apple Daily. Digital versus real life events. Mac OS Big Sur 11.3 Beta, new features. And landing an iMac on Mars. Plus notification squad and iCave answers. Noah's Ark edition. For the latest Apple news, rumors and leaks, every weekday at 12 UTC, join us in the iCave. I'm iCave Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you. And if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumors every weekday at 12 UTC, like this video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell so that you don't miss a thing and you can join our notification squad by posting up hashtag notification squad down in the comments. Digital versus real life Apple events. So yesterday I ran a couple of polls about this. I wanted to see what you guys were thinking and I think I probably agree. On Twitter at the time of shooting, we were at 39% for on stage and 61% for all digital and 37 to 63% on YouTube in the same direction. So it seems like the majority of you guys love Apple's digital events. The only one that I think probably could change is assuming that it's easier to travel by that point would be WWDC as that is the in-person developer conference. So if a physical event can happen in 2021, most likely on June the 1st, we believe, then that would be the one that would change. I have to say though, I found it interesting how many people loved the digital format. I think Apple's done a great job of giving them a sense of place and connecting the segments with those amazing like fly arounds of Apple Park in Cupertino. And one thing that I think is great is that it kind of levels everyone. There's no difference for the elite tech journalists from the rest of us. We all get to experience the events in the same way at the same time, so we don't feel like second class citizens by sitting at home. I'm just hoping that we continue to see as many, if not more events in 2021, starting, we hope, with this month. Mac OS Big Sur 11.3 Beta 3 new features. So Big Sur 11.3 Beta 3 is here and 11.3 is bringing some new and improved features to the Mac. There's quite a lot so we'll fly through these and whatever sounds most interesting to you let me know down in the comments and we'll dive deeper in a future video or one of the shorts. So Safari is getting new customization with the start page with developers gaining access to build their own integration units and Apple adding Siri suggestions and more. Safari also gets support for WebM video formats. There are improvements to running iOS and iPad apps on M1 Macs with touch alternative keystrokes. Reminders get an update too with new sorting options and the ability to print reminder lists. Apple Music gets a made for you page as well as autoplay which will continue after the end of a next up list or a playlist. Apple News gets a redesigned News Plus tab with its own for you section too. There's now support for stereo pairs of HomePods as a default option for your Mac. And finally, but most interestingly, battery optimization for the Mac will now check your calendar to make sure that your battery is fully charged three hours ahead of any events as part of an effort to reduce how long the battery is held at 100% to help battery health in the longer term. Landing an iMac on Mars. I am a space geek and I have a feeling that a lot of the people that watch the videos on my channel probably at least have a passing interest in space exploration and the tech around it. So I think it's a fascinating story. Now this came to my attention via Mac Rumors, but I've researched a bit more into this than they did. So this is a little bit more in depth. Go with me. So the Perseverance mission launched from Cape Canaveral's Pad 41 on top of an Atlas V on July 30th last year, arriving at Mars and landing on February the 18th, 2021, and landing in Jezero Crater after being slowed by the Martian atmosphere, and then a parachute before finally being lowered to the surface by Sky Crane. That's basically a rocket powered bed frame that hovers over the surface as the rover is lowered down, the tethers are cut, and the Sky Crane flies away to crash land a safe distance away. So what on Earth, or in fact on Mars, does the iMac have to do with the Perseverance rover? Well, the onboard computation uses a PowerPC 750 chip, which is exactly the same chip that powered the original 1998 iMac. Now, there are certainly some changes. It runs slightly slower for a start. So 200 megahertz instead of the iMac's starting configuration of 233. And this chip is radiation hardened and manufactured by BAE Systems. And it comes with a hefty price tag of $200,000 each. Radiation can quite easily flip individual bits during processing. So it's important to include redundancies with these kinds of systems. And the rover actually has two of these RCE or rover compute element computers on board. Perseverance also has two gigs of flash memory. That's a lot I know. You could get a few pictures in there. 
It also has an enormous 256 megabytes of RAM and 256 kilobytes of electronically erasable programmable ROM. The rover also has an inertial measurement unit which gives it three axis information to the processor on orientation, attitude of the rover, all that sort of stuff, which is basically like the accelerometer that's in your iPhone. But this actually isn't the first time that these chips have flown in space, not by a long way. The RAD 750, which is the name of this radiation hardened version, has also powered the Deep Impact Comet Chaser in 2005, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Worldview 1, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, the Kepler Space Telescope, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO, which is around the Moon, the Juno Jupiter probe, the Curiosity rover that's already on Mars, and 140 other spacecraft too. And that RAD 750 can withstand 200,000 to 1 million rads of radiation. Temperature ranges between minus 55 and plus 125 degrees Celsius and consumes a mere 10 watts of power along with its motherboard. So when you look at an old iMac G3, you'll know that its descendants are more than just colorful iMacs that we are looking forward to seeing later this year. So we've got no new members to my notification squad today, which is very disappointing because I need to beat Mr. Tech Hyped to 10,000 subscribers and he has a three and a half thousand uh, subscriber head start on me. So please let your friends know. And now it's time for the Noah's Ark of iCave answers because they seem to have come in today two by two. First up, my arch nemesis Tech Hype asks, as you know, we're gonna see uh, AirPods really soon. Are you gonna upgrade? So right now I have no intention of upgrading my AirPods. I absolutely love my second generation AirPods, even though I put them through the washing machine and the dryer and they still work somehow. Uh, but no, I'm not planning on it unless for some reason they manage to put spatial audio maybe into AirPods, uh, the non-pro ones. If they do that, I might be tempted. If not, probably not for now because these are still really good. And Tech Hype's second question. I gave answers, what is your iPhone condition right now as I know you don't use a case? So yeah, that's true. Um, I have had a lot of cases, as you probably know if you've been watching this channel for a while because we had a whole bunch sent to us by ESR, which we we're doing a giveaway for. I've tried out pretty much all of the cases. I do like having a case on there when I'm out and about, but at home, uh, and let's be honest, most of our time is spent at home right now. I don't put a case on it. I just like, I just love the feel of the iPhone itself. And this year is probably gonna be slightly different for me. Normally, I don't actually end up selling off, my, uh, selling on my phones. I did sell on my 10s Max uh, last year because that's basically when I started buying a whole bunch of new Apple stuff uh, for this channel. So things like the iPad Air. Um, so I sold that off to help fund it. This year, I might well sell the 12 Pro Max. Uh, it depends how compelling the new iPhones are this year and if I need to upgrade so that I can kind of keep up to date on stuff for the channel. Um, so it might get sold, but right now it, it looks immaculate. There's one small scratch on the screen, uh, which is now underneath a matte screen protector because that's the one thing that I do put on there. But the rest of it, you would not know it had been out of the box. It is uh, a really durable phone. Estatorios Maximos. I still have an iPad Air first generation 2013 and I think you have one too, so how does it hold up? Great video idea. Um, yeah, actually, they do do really well. Now, it is stuck on iOS, uh, sorry, iPadOS. I'm not sure if it was iPadOS by this point, but it's uh, version 12, 12.4 um, point something, I think, 4.3 maybe, something around that. Um, so it's, it doesn't run the latest software. It is a little bit slow for that. But uh, this is actually my wife's main iPad at the moment. Um, she's got the new MacBook Air, so that's become her main thing. But she does a lot of her Zoom meetings and stuff still on that iPad, so it's very serviceable for that. She's got it in a keyboard clamshell case as well, so she can actually do typing on it, which she doesn't tend to do nowadays because she's now got the, uh, the MacBook Air. But yeah, it's quite a serviceable thing. I, I will do a full video on it. I think it's great as a content consumption device it's not new enough to have apple pencil support or anything like that apple pencil didn't exist when it came out and when you think back as well the ipad air was actually what replaced the uh the ipad with retina display which was the one that had the fat bezels all the way around the outside um which was the fourth generation this was the fifth generation then the sixth was the ipad air 2 and then they went to the regular ipad and ipad pro and then for some reason it just kind of ballooned out and we got pro and air and 
regular iPad, and we're running out of fingers for where all of the iPads are going to go. Uh, but yeah, it still holds up if you just need to do basic stuff. The biggest disadvantage of it at the moment is the storage is only 16 gigs on board, which is a bit tight. And in S. Sartorius Maximus's second question, IK okay, answers, what would you advise a small YouTuber to do in order to grow and possibly beat tech hyped? This is this is an interesting one because obviously I'm not a huge YouTuber. I don't have like this massive following. It's something I want to build and we are working on building. Uh, the way that I've got to where I have though, because we've only been going, what, just over six months, uh, maybe eight months now. The way that we've got here is this engaging with you guys. So like I try to answer every single uh, comment in the comment section. Uh, I don't think I ignore anyone. If I've missed one of your comments, let me know because YouTube isn't telling me that I've missed it because there's nothing in my pending. So yeah, I just try to kind of be a part of this community because I don't think there's many YouTubers out there that are actively on pretty much every video answering people's questions, certainly not in the tech space. There is in like movie blogs and I always watched uh, John Campier um, and the stuff that he does. He does a huge amount of Q&A stuff. That's kind of how he does all of his shows. But I've also followed Gary Vee for a long time and I do some work with his Facebook group and I'm gonna be doing more of that going forward. So uh, yeah, it's just a case of kind of engaging with the people that are watching and trying to uh, make content that's interesting for people that want to kind of watch your stuff. The reason that we kind of got as big as we did is that the timing was really good. So in November, uh, we had obviously the Apple Silicon stuff coming. That's really what I'd been talking about all the way through. So the launch of Apple Silicon really helped, but I think once we get back into uh, event season, we're probably gonna see quite a bit of growth. So keep watching and I really appreciate all of you being here. Next up, Savik Murkaji asks, I want to know how many years Apple will keep their current squared off iPhone design. Hopefully they won't change it when I'll buy my next iPhone. I simply can't take my eyes off from the squared off look. So yeah, I mean, they're not gonna be changing it right away. Uh, we will probably see at least three years of it, I would think. They tend to be doing kind of three year-ish cycles at the moment. So if we think back, we had the iPhone 10, the iPhone 10s, and the iPhone 11 that all kept the same kind of physical uh, industrial design style along with the uh, iPhone 10R, which came into that chunk as well. But it's certainly a three year cycle there. Before that, we had the iPhone 6, 6S, 7. Those three years were kind of what led us up to the iPhone 10, but then they retained that for the iPhone 8, which came out at the same time as the 10 and then the uh, SE used that as well. So I think we are probably looking at three years of this kind of style of design before we move on to something completely different in the frame, but they may well change what the displays look like within this frame in the meantime. And second question for Savik Murkaji, I didn't have any issue whatsoever with Apple for removing the adapters from iPhone boxes, but if we were to reduce carbon emissions and removing charger from the box is the way that tech giants like Apple should consider, then why bother to include that damn thing in iPad and MacBook boxes? So uh, for this, I think the difference is uh, people have got a higher end charger less often than they would have a phone charger. So although Apple decided to change the cable inexplicably to put in the USB-C chargers with the iPhone 12s. Uh, I think they might have included them with the 11, but I never had one, so I wouldn't know. Because they've done that, it made it difficult for people to actually use the new cable that came with it. I mean, I only had one USB-C brick here already, but as you can probably see behind me, we have a lot of devices to be charged and they all take USB-A. So, there's a little bit of a disconnect there, which I think was probably a mistake for Apple. And also they are gonna be completely changing this in the nearish future, moving back over to MagSafe for the chargers. Now, there is a decent possibility that it's gonna be MagSafe on one end with USB that plugs into the, uh, the wall brick. So that might be the way that they change things, but you ask whether we should still get the wall brick with it. I would say, because less people have the higher powered chargers than a phone level charger, you probably do need it. Like if you're buying a high-end MacBook Pro, they come with nearly a 100 watt charger, I think. So you need that amount in order to be able to power it so you can use it and charge the battery at the same time. Um, with the iPads, probably less so, but things like the HomePod has to come with one as well because you can't use the thing without it, it doesn't have a battery on board. The iPads, 
maybe they will go down that route because there are a lot of iPad chargers out there and USB-C in general is uh, is fine for this. So thank you for the question. Saad Ismail asks, and this is Apple Tomorrow on Twitter, as we all remember, Apple faced all of the backlash for removing the headphone jack back in the day. Bill Schiller called it courage, which everyone laughed at, but in my opinion, removing the headphone jack or any other bold move like not supporting flash, etc., does take a lot of courage since Apple has to face the brunt of the bad press while other companies wait it out. What are your thoughts? So I've got to say, I agree. Um, Apple doesn't just arbitrarily remove a headphone jack because they don't want to have a headphone jack anymore. They don't do it because they want to sell more wireless stuff. They've done it because it is a legacy port. And we were talking about the iMac earlier. Going way back to the original iMac, they were removing ports that everyone else expected you to have, like SCSI ports and parallel ports and things like that, which, you know, even Apple's own ADB connector, I believe, was taken out, which was what you used to uh, connect your keyboard and mouse by, and they introduced USB. It didn't have a floppy drive, and this is in 1998 when everything had floppy drives, and they got so much flack for that as well. I don't think any of the post-Steve Jobs return Macs actually had a floppy drive, and, and that was just absolute blasphemy at the time. So... Absolutely, but Apple has a history of this. They removed the optical drives from the 2008 uh, MacBook Air. That was the first laptop that you could get really without an optical drive. So yes, Apple is brave and they are pushing the limits and they are one of the companies, one of the very few companies that does actually push companies to be better and, and other computer companies to be better. And maybe USB-C was a little bit early because there's still not enough stuff out there with USB-C. But, uh, but it's still a better port than USB-A, and it does make sense. So yeah, I completely agree uh, they are doing the right thing. And James Apple asks, Ming-Chi Kuo also said that Touch ID rumors need to be put to bed for the next iPhone. With the next iOS 14.5 and watchOS 7.4 coming up somewhere in spring 2021 with the Apple Watch unlocking iPhone, I believe the rumors of Touch ID will sizzle out because not everyone on planet Earth who owns an iPhone have an Apple Watch. However, when this update is available, I believe the Apple Watch sales will be equivalent to the amount of billions of worldwide units of users that have iPhones. I don't see people refusing to buy an Apple Watch with the update because the alternative is for every stranger or no-name person knowing your passcode and your business, and I think that it makes all the sense in the world. What are your thoughts? So yeah, I think there is probably going to be a boost to Apple Watch sales. I don't by any means think that everyone with an iPhone is going to be buying one. And remember, not every iPhone is Face ID. There are there are still a lot of iPhone SEs out there. I've got an iPhone 8 here, which has also got Touch ID. I've also got other stuff knocking around. There's a 6 or a 6S over there somewhere. So there's a lot of iPhones out there. Although we've got a billion iPhones out there in use, that doesn't mean that there's a billion Face ID iPhones out there. And that doesn't mean by any stretch that there's going to be a billion people that need an Apple Watch all of a sudden. But I do think that the sales are going to take a boost, which is great. But I also do think that the Touch ID is still going to come to these next generation of phones. And I think Apple is going to get its little boost of Apple Watch sales in the meantime. I don't think, uh, I don't think they're going to cancel the idea of having Touch ID as well as Face ID, just because you can also use your watch. So that's it for this show, guys. If you've got any questions, leave them down in the comment section with hashtag iCaveAnswers so I can answer them in the next show for you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.